For about a decade now, the diet world has gone mad for low GI diets. I should know, I was one of the first authors to write about the glycemic index. But in this short video, I want to show you why books and other information which rely on the glycemic index are not as useful as you've been led to believe and can be downright misleading. In 1999, I wrote Eat Fat Get Thin. Published by Vermillion in the UK, it was the UK's first diet book for weight loss which talked about the glycemic index, or GI. At that time, the recently formulated GI looked like a valuable way to determine what effect different foods would have on our bodies and make weight loss easier to manage. So, wanting to give my readers the best and most useful information I could, I included it and listed many foods with both their carbohydrate content and with their GI. But in 1999 the GI was still a work in progress, and as it progressed it became clear that there were many anomalies which were making the GI less and less useful. What is GI? The glycemic index is a measure of how much carbohydrates and foods which contain carbs raise blood glucose and thus insulin levels. It was originally designed as an aid for diabetics. To compile this index, scientists fed 50 grams of glucose to their test participants and measured how much this raised their subject's blood glucose. That became their reference point and they labelled it 100. Then they tested participants with other foods and measured blood glucose response of each of them relative to the glucose meal. If a food raised their test subject's blood glucose levels to 50% of the reference, then it had a GI of 50, and if it raised blood glucose by 70%, then its GI was 70, and so on. Note incidentally that this was a measure of how much blood glucose was raised, not how quickly which is how the GI is often misleadingly used today. Foods were then arbitrarily split into three groups. A GI of 70 or more was classed as high, 56 to 69 was medium, 55 and under was regarded as low. But that really doesn't tell us much, because one cube of sugar has a GI of 65, and a pound of sugar is also 65. So how much sugar can you eat? Well, there's no way to tell. But as bread's GI is around 75, you can obviously eat more sugar than bread. Or can you? To counter this problem, the scientists measured the effects of different amounts of food and the GI and compiled another table called the glycemic load, or GL. That appeared to solve the problems and provide a workable framework that diabetics and people wanting to lose weight could use to guide them. But then, as more work was done, it started to become obvious that there was a wide range of potential errors and anomalies which could make a nonsense of the GI, as well as GL, because GL, of course, is based on GI. Take bread, for example. We're frequently told to eat wholemeal bread, in preference to white bread, with words like complex carbohydrates that come from whole grains, like whole wheat flour, brown rice, whole oatmeal and other whole grains, take longer to process in the bloodstream, so insulin levels in the blood tend to be much steadier. These kinds of healthy carbohydrates are what the body needs for energy. It's a myth. The difference between the GIs of white bread and wholemeal bread is only one. White bread is on average 75, whole meal is on average 74. That's a difference of only one and that's hardly earth shattering. And then there's the flour that's used to make the bread. White flour made by Hovis in UK can range between 61 and 85. White flour made by Sainsbury's in the UK goes from 60 to 80. While white flour in Italy goes from anything from 77 to 101. Wholemeal flour can actually be worse. Wholemeal flour made by Hope is 59 to 77. Wholemeal flour by Sainsbury's 59 to 83, so very similar. But wholemeal flour in France can be as high as 112. And then there are differences of GI in the same food made by the same manufacturer, but made in a different plant. If we look at Kellogg's All Bran, we find that it has a GI of 30, if it's made in Australia, it can be anything between 38 and 62 in the USA, between 46 and 56 in Canada. And what is this in the UK? I haven't the foggiest idea, and nobody else has either. 
because nobody's tested it. You might think that Kellogg's Special K, a cereal which is promoted as being high in protein, would have a lower GI, but it may actually be worse depending on where you live. According to the official list published in 2002, the GI of Special K varies between 54, which is low GI in Australia, 69, which is medium in the USA, and 84, uh, which is high in France. Again, we don't know what the GI of the UK's version of Special K is, because this hasn't been tested either. And there's some rather strange anomalies. For example, you might think that foods containing sugar would have a higher GI than the same food made without sugar. But banana cake made with sugar has a GI of 47, while banana cake made without sugar is higher at 55. Another oddity is that slicing bread appears to increase its GI. Gluten-free white bread unsliced, made with gluten-free wheat starch in the UK, has a GI of 71, and exactly the same bread, made with the same ingredients, sliced, is 80. I mean, you couldn't make it up, could you? Yet another anomaly is that lower GI doesn't necessarily mean lower glucose levels in the blood. A recent study compared blood glucose responses to either cornflakes or a bran cereal, both of which contain 50 grams of carbohydrate. As the fibre-rich bran cereal had a GI which was less than half of the cornflakes GI, you might expect the bran to have been beneficial. But you'd be wrong. There was no significant difference between the two. What actually happened was that although the cornflakes raised glucose more initially, 20 minutes after the meal the bran had raised insulin levels almost twice as high as had the cornflakes. This removed glucose from the blood more quickly. Thus the lower GI of bran was not because it had a lower effect on raising glucose, but because it caused an earlier and bigger release of insulin. So if you are an insulin deficient type 1 diabetic, lower GI foods such as bran might not be such a good idea. And hyperinsulinemia, which means high blood insulin levels, is a recognised cause of type 2 diabetes. Then again, the food, way a food is cooked or processed or grown makes a difference to its final GI, according to a trial conducted at the Department of Dietetics, Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Hong Kong. So the GI of a food that you prepare may well have a very different GI if it is prepared by somebody else. An example of that, here are the GIs of similar breads with the same recipe, but with different proving times. The proving time is the amount of time allowed for the yeast to do its work and puff the bread up, make it spongy. As you can see, merely by changing the time the yeast has to do its work can put the bread's GI anywhere between low GI at 34 and very high at 107. And it's not just the food that might change this effect. Strangely, the sex and age of those who eat the foods also has an effect. In this Danish study, the glycemic index and glycemic load were positively associated with body fatness among Danish boys aged 16. But there was no similar association found among younger boys or among girls of any age. And lower GI doesn't necessarily mean healthier, particularly if you're diabetic. The GI of fructose, the sugar found in fruit, is 15 which is very much lower than sucrose, which is the white table sugar, which is 65. For this reason, diabetics are recommended to use fructose as a sweetener in preference to sugar. And yet fructose is far more damaging to a diabetic's health than is sucrose. For example, there is considerable scientific evidence that shows that various sugars have very different effects on blood lipids, particularly on LDL cholesterol. One study found that fructose glycosylated haemoglobin seven times faster than glucose. This may be important because glycosylation, as well as oxidation of other proteins, including LDL and HDL particles, may increase the ro growth rate of atheroma. And the atheroma is the plaque that blocks up your arteries. Yet another study found that fructose appears to increase total cholesterol, primarily by elevating LDL again. 
The authors say there is now reason to believe that dietary fructose will increase the risk of atherosclerosis. That's your arteries clogging up. And there's also no reason to assume that it doesn't have a similarly harmful effect in non-diabetics. The GI only applies to food which contains carbs. This means that foods containing only fats and protein, such as meat, fish, cheese, eggs, butter, olive oil, lard and so on, which have a GI of zero, because they don't raise glucose at all, are excluded from the GI lists. You won't find them. They're just irrelevant. They're all as low GI as it's possible to get, and should form a major part of any low GI diet, a proper one. Now this might not matter if this fact were explained, but it isn't. And that allows authors with restricted knowledge, or a hidden agenda, to fraudulently misrepresent these foods. The best way to lower the GI of any carbohydrate-rich food is to add fat to it whereas the impression often implied is that adding fat makes it worse. So, overall, the GI and GL are of little practical use. This was shown in a five-year test at the University of South Carolina Arnold School of Public Health, the National Institutes of Diabetes, Digestive and Kidney Diseases, Bethesda, Maryland, in the USA, and the German Institute of Human Nutrition, Potsdam Ruhrbrücke, Germany, which was published in 2006. Starting in 1994-6 and following 1,255 adults for five years, the researchers evaluated glycemic index and glycemic load of foods eaten in relation to blood glucose levels measured before meals and two hours afterwards. When the dietary information was analysed, researchers found absolutely no association between glycemic index levels and blood sugar levels. They concluded that, quote, present results call into question the utility of GI and GL to reflect glycemic response to food adequately when used in the context of usual diet. Considering the huge amount of work that's been done on GI in different countries over a quarter of a century, it really is disappointing that GI is not as useful as it was hoped it would be. But to sum up, the glycemic index is a very weak tool which is oversimplified, overhyped, oversold and misrepresented. While it might have some limited use in a clinical setting, it is really of very little practical help to the general public and the glycemic load figures, which are based on it, are far too complicated even if they weren't reliant on the GI. The GI is frequently used to confuse and mislead. But even if GI and GL were more useful, they really have very little practical value because what matters by far, as far as your body is concerned, is not the GI of a carbohydrate, but the total amount you eat. 100 grams of carbohydrate is 100 grams of carbohydrate, whatever its GI may be. Now, I had worked much of this out by 2005 while writing the second edition of Eat Fat Get Thin, which my publisher, Vermillion, had asked for. But by then, Vermillion was publishing several other low GI books by other authors. Vermillion's editorial staff liked my revised edition, but the marketing people couldn't see how they could promote it, while also promoting the newer GI books, which despite giving misleading information were selling well. They asked me to re rewrite my book, but I believe in telling the truth, not in misleading people. So I changed publishers and the work became a new book called Natural Health and Weight Loss. Reviewing it in 2007 when it was published as a paperback, Professor Joel M. Kaufman of the, of the University of Sciences in Philadelphia said of it, Natural Health and Weight Loss may be the best non-technical book on diet ever written. Natural Health and Weight Loss is now available, by the way, as an e-book from the 1st of October this year. For more on Glycemic Index and Foods for Diabetics, please see my website at www.curediabeteswithdiet.org. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening. If you like this video, please help me by liking it with the button below. Thanks again.